Mwele Timbegi is fast becoming my favorite <laughs> political analyst in South Africa. In an interview on Power FM, he was asked about Sol Ramaphosa and this Tumamina story that he's sold us. Um, Mwele Timbegi, without mincing his words, uh, said that Sol Ramaphosa is not a leader and that he is never, has never been a leader. He said uh, Nelson Mandela was a leader. His brother, ex-president Tabombe, he was a leader. And even Jacob Zuma was a leader. But uh, Usuro is not a leader. He wakes up in the morning, according to Mwele Tsimpegi. He asks, where is the wind blowing? Let's go with the wind. The guy makes no decisions. And he's failed as a president. He goes on to add that Usuro has got a better PR machine than Bell Pottinger. Uh, at some point, Bell Pottinger was accused during the, the Zuma era as a PR machine, I think, from Europe or the UK. And he says he's got a better PR machine in this country where the media paints him as a darling that is out to save South Africa, but he is not capable to do that. He goes on to call him a Russian term called an aparachik. <laughs> Constantly learning these new terms. An aparachik uh, formally is a member of a communist party, but he spoke about it as a party agent. Uh, Umwele Tsimbegi saying Usuril is just a party agent that was sent to, to do whatever he was sent to do. I, I just thought I'd, I'd start off with that. I used to not like Umwele Tsimbegi. I thought he was an uppity black back in the day. Um, at some point, I think I thought he was defending white interests, whatever. But the guy has come out to be quite a revolutionary thinker. He's willing to challenge his own brother. And he's he's been scathing with how he he criticizes and analyzes the African National Congress. And the ANC government is a government that still serves the British, you know, and has turned South Africa into a second-hand country of just black labor and where our resources and our produce is uh, milked and sucked out by foreigners. I want to start off this morning by reading uh, some education for you guys uh, about a town I love speaking about called Urania. Urania is a white Afrikaner-only town in South Africa. It is located along the Orange River in the Karoo region of the Northern Cape province. It is 871 kilometers from Cape Town and 680 kilometers from Pretoria. The town was founded with the goal of creating a stronghold for the Afrikaner minority group, the Afrikaans language and the Afrikaner culture through the creation of a white Afrikaner ethnostate known as a folk start. Although Orania, in accordance with South Africa's constitution, has no formal law banning black visitors, in practice only Afrikaner residents are permitted. Black people nearby fear that they will be met with violence if they were to visit. As of 2020, the population was 2,066 people. Living in the town requires application uh, and is based around being Afrikaner and fluent in Afrikaans. The town's economy is focused around self-sufficiency self -sufficiency and based on agriculture, notably of pecan nuts. Okay. Orania prints its own money, known as the Ora, uh, but receives no local or national funding. The town's segregationist, segregationist philosophy rejects the concept of bar scarp, where the white minority exploited black labor for economic gain, in favor of a model of strict Afrikaner self-sufficiency. Two South African presidents have visited the town. Nelson Mandela visited in 1995 and Jacob Zuma visited in 2010. The stated goal of Orania's founders was the preservation of Afrikaner cultural heritage and self-verksamate, self-reliance. All jobs from management to manual labor are done by Afrikaners. Black or colored mixed race people are not allowed to live or work there. Critics accuse the town authorities of rejecting the Rainbow Nation concept and trying to recreate apartheid-era South Africa within a white ethno-state. Residents argue that they wish to preserve their own Afrikaner cultural heritage and protect themselves from crime in South Africa. They also reject the white label uh, as meaningless and rather identify as third Afrikaners. Uh, bit of history. The idea that Afrikaners should concentrate in a limited region of South Africa was first circulated by the South African Bureau for Racial Affairs, SABRA, SABRA, in 1966. By the 1970s, 
Sabra advocated the idea of transforming South Africa into a commonwealth where different population groups would develop parallel to each other. At the time, mainstream Afrikaners supported the Bantustan policy, which allocated 174,307 square kilometers for the 14, 15 million black Africans living in South Africa at the time. May 1984 saw the establishment of the Afrikaner Volkswagen, an organization founded by Karl Bosov, a right-wing academic and the son-in-law of former South African Prime Minister Hendrik Vervoet. The goal of the Afrikaner Volkswagen was to put the ideas of the Sabra into practice. Bosov regarded contemporary plans of the National Party government to retain control through limited reforms as doomed to fail. Believing that black majority rule could not be avoided, he supported the creation of a separate, smaller state for the Afrikaner nation instead. In 1988, Bosov founded the Afrikaner Freiheit Stichten, Afrikaner Freedom Foundation or Afstich. The founding principles of the Afstich were based on the belief that since black majority rule was unavoidable and European minority rule morally unjustifiable, Afrikaners would have to form their own nation or folk start in a smaller part of South Africa. Orania was intended to be the basis of the folk start, which would come into existence once a large number of Afrikaners moved to Orania and other such growth points and would eventually include the towns of Priska, Britstown, Carnarvon, Carnarvon, Williston and Calvinia reaching the West Coast. On 23 April 1994, the Freedom Front, the African National Congress and the National Party signed the Accord on African Self-Determination. This led to Article 235 of, Const of the Constitution of South Africa, which guarantees the right of self-determination for cultural groups. Let's see here. Proponents of the idea consider that this model would demand significant economic sacrifices from Afrikaners who moved to the folk start. The model is based on the principle of own labor, requiring that all work in the folk start be performed by its citizens, including plowing fields, collecting garbage and tending gardens, which is traditionally performed by blacks in the rest of South Africa. Let's see, The town's original objective was to create an Afrikaner majority in the Northwestern Cape, by encouraging the construction of other such towns with the eventual goal of an Afrikaner majority in the area and, the independent, and an independent Afrikaner state between Orania and the West Coast. Bosov had originally envisaged a population of 60,000 after 15 years. While he conceded that most Afrikaners might not decide to move to the full start, he thought it was essential Afrikaners have this option since it would, have, it would make them feel more secure, thereby reducing tensions in the rest of South Africa. In December 1990, about 40 Afrikaner families headed by Karl Bosov uh, bought the dilapidated town of Orania for around 1.5 million rand, 585,000 US dollars. On behalf of Orania Bestir Dienste from the Department of Water Affairs. In the lead up to the move, some 500 black and colored people still lived in Orania, then called Groot Gewacht. 64 families were evicted by the Department of Water Affairs early 1991. In one of the last large-scale forced removals of apartheid, the families were provided newly built homes but were taken more than 100 kilometers away to Warrington in the Northern Cape. Groot Gewacht village was renamed Klein Geluk. In April 1991, the first inhabitants moved into Orania. At that time, the town consisted of 90 houses in Orania and 60 in Klein, Klein Geluk all in serious disrepair. In August 1991, the 2,300-hectare farm um, Fle Fleikes was added to Orania. The National Party government, led by F.W. de Klerk, opposed the creation of an Afrikaner state and the existence of Orania, but it took no action believing it would fail on its own. The town council was established in February 1992. Let's see... Blah, 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 blah. The town relied on neighboring farms for food. Orania elected, elected its own transitional representative council, a temporary form of local government created after the end of apartheid in 1995. Construction on an immigration sch irrigation scheme to cover a 400 hectare area began in 1995 and was completed in 1996. In a concili conciliatory gesture, President Nelson Mandela visited the town in 1995 to have tea with Betsy Fervut, 
the widow of form, former Prime Minister Hendrik Verwoerd. Oranje grew to 200 permanent inhabitants in 1996. By 1998, 15 million rand had been invested in the town for expenses, including the upgrading of water and electricity supply, roads and businesses. On the 5th of June 1998, Vali Musa, then Minister of Constitutional Development in the African National Congress government, stated in a parliamentary budget debate that the ideal of some Afrikaners to develop the Northwestern Cape as a home for the Afrikaner culture and language within the framework of the Constitution and the Charter of Human Rights is viewed by the government as a legitimate ideal. On the 14th of September 2010, the President of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, visited Orania. He said that he was warmly welcomed, that Orania had interesting ideas, and the Oraniers were prepared to live in South Africa but wanted a place to exercise their culture. If you ever get a chance, go on YouTube, type in Orania, type in Karl Bosov, and you'll get a great interview hearing from Karl his views on Orania, how it was founded, what work they do, and their vision. I find it highly inspiring um, as what uh, classified as a black South African and a black African. I've gone through the phases of consciousness, of anger, of wanting revolution. The principles of Stephen Bantubiko, looking at EPAC, Robert Mangaliso, Sobuwe, looking at the origins of the African National Congress with all John Langalbalele Dube and Isama Pixki Kaseme, or Chief Albert Lutuli and the boys, you know, and I've had issues with. Uh, white people, white Afrikaans people, the history of this country, the oppression and the exploitation of black people. Luckily, I have a mind that allows me to look beyond a whole lot of different things and analyze on a deeper level to realize that a lot of the white people who enjoy privilege, even to this day, which is, it was just consequences of a group of white leaders who decided to do that for their people. In the same way that I, as a man, have got male privilege, which I did not earn on my, by myself. It's because a group of men have cemented that men are superior to women and have allowed me these privileges that ensure that when I walk in the streets, I'm not scared of randomly being raped, for example, and I don't fear my female partner to dominate me physically. With that being said, I'm able to look through these things and see the beauty and the good in some of these concepts that black people, because of emotion and because of trauma and history, refuse to even engage. The idea of a town that is self-sufficient, self-sufficiency, is something that even all Bantu Bigo wanted. They wanted a separated state in South Africa where black people could live and thrive on their own and have their own businesses and their own enterprise. Of course, the apartheid government didn't want that. O King Mswati decided to be, create his own kingdom of Eswatini. Um Shwesh created his own kingdom of Lesotho. At some point, Ukudu Zuelitini was threatening to build an independent state known as the Kingdom of Guazulu. We hear now that in the Western Cape, they are trying to create an independent state of the Western Cape. Orania is not an independent state, but it is, it is a great social experiment of a group of white Afrikaans people who said, without black people, we are going to build our own town. And they got a piece of land. They've created irrigation, they've fixed electricity, they've fixed water, and they are surviving. They've built their own schools. They've got their own money. I think that this is something that black South Africans in particular need to admire and need to learn from. In the same way that I think that black South Africans need to learn from AfriForum as a non-profit non -profit organization which fights for the rights and the beliefs of Afrikaner people and the Afrikaner culture. Orania is a white Afrikaans only space. But I've said before that if you go to the bulk of all the townships in this country, which have millions of people, millions of black people living in them, those are black only areas. Obviously, white people are invited to be there. They're not kept out. But it's generally black areas. Orania, I mean, white people are 8% of this country. Black people are 80%. What is stopping black people from fencing their townships, creating fences around them, and making sure that there is something like border control where you choose who comes in and who goes out? And within these townships, you also get to pick who runs businesses here. If you don't want Pakistanis and Somalians and Ethiopians and Nigerians and Malawians and Mozambicans and Zimbabweans to be there, you can get rid of them. It is your own space and you can use the same constitution to fight for the rights, the democratic rights of the people within that space. Set up your own mini governments in that space, your own leadership groups that can maybe even have their own currency. Make sure that you have your own security forces, even if it's citizens there that are doing neighborhood watch, who are constantly patrolling the streets so that you are safe. 
root out drug problems, root out alcohol, and create your own constitution for that space. That's how estates such as Waterfall City, Stain City, for example, that's how they are run. They are run like mini countries where no one can just come in and out as they please. As much as we are a free country and there's freedom of movement, you can't get into there without authority. No foreigner, not even a South African foreigner, can go into these spaces without um, the right validation and approval. Even in small complexes, for example. What is stopping black people from doing that? See the South African government, see your Cyrils, your ANCs, just as a supplier of your little town, your little nation. But be self-sufficient and own your rights and be independent. Huey Newton and the Black, Panther, Black Panthers Party in, in America were very big on self-reliance and self-sufficiency. So was Marcus Garvey. You know, these were people that stood for the ability to do for yourself. When you listen to Karol Bosov speaking about Orania, their flag um, has a, um, a, a little Afrikaans boy with, who's busy rolling up his sleeve for them to, to um, exude this mantra of a Burmaka plan, that you must roll up your sleeves and you must be willing to work. Something that black South Africans have lost. Our ancestors, our forefathers were able to build houses made of straw, made of mud. They were able to look after and breed their own livestock. They were able to work their fields without tractors, without government assistance and money. But using water, using basic tools, they were able to farm and grow their own food. They could hunt. They could forage. They were self-sufficient and independent. Today, black South Africans, by and large, are dependent and have become beggars and children of the government. They have bought into this idea that without money, you are nothing. And because of that, they are largely poor. Almost half of the population, 29.3 million people, live on grants. And they feel that without an RTP house, without free health care, without free schooling, without a feeding scheme, without money, without fancy Western clothing, they are nothing. We can't even make our own clothing anymore as black South Africans. And it is frankly embarrassing. It lacks dignity. And black people, by and large, need to refine their dignity and learn to do for self. Learn to fix your own car. Learn to do your own plumbing. Learn to do your own electrical work. Learn how to build your own house. Learn how to breed and groom your own livestock. Learn how to plant your own food. Make weapons. Have guns. And learn how to defend yourselves. Learn how to educate your own children. Write your own books and your own literature. Write your own history. Create new languages if, if that's what's needed. Because Kosa, Zulu, Debele, Swati all come from Nguni. You've got the Sutu languages of Sipedi, Sisutu, uh, Setswana, as an example. We've got Shitsonga, we've got Venda. Those are languages that were created by people. You can create your own languages. You can create your own religions as I have created my religion of penalism. You can create your own clothing. I did a video before speaking about how Isaiah Shembe, the founder of Iban uh, Nazareta, the Shembe Church, how he was fusing African wear and Western wear and creating his own clothing for the people of the Shembe Church. It is completely up to you and it requires you to own your mind, to put your hand up as a leader and to say, we will fence our own townships or our own neighborhoods. There are Jewish, there are Muslim neighborhoods in South Africa that are fenced off. You can't just drive in and out of there as you please. There's security. So when you worry about illegal foreigners, you can control your space. You can fence your space. You can capture who is living within that space. And you can make sure that you uplift them. And create many countries and many independent states in South Africa. Where if a Capitec, a KFC, a PEP want to come in, they need to speak to the leadership first. Can we come and build a mall here? Can we come and place our businesses here? And you guys have the right to say no. Or like King Swat, you can say you can come in here as long as you're going to give us 50% ownership of whatever business is coming here and we also have to sit down and create a mandate where you are forced to hire our people you are forced to upskill our people you are forced to take our people to wherever you come from so that they can learn and you can share skills and give them resources and we can build together as a nation and then we can be alliance partners and we can work with you i think this is fundamentally important especially for black south africans to understand these lessons and to realize your home can be your country your neighborhood can be your country. Your community and your township can be your country. You just have to have the right, strong leadership. Learn from these people. Copy and paste what they've done. You can study other countries that were created from scratch. How do you build borders? How do you set up your own constitution, your own government? How do you have your own mandate? How do you make sure that you liaise with the greater government?
to see if they can supply you electricity and water and how do you pay them so that you are fine and then how do you do for yourself so that you can be strong and independent. Penuel the black pen. Penuelism is the answer. Penuel is God.